Hello, happy Halloween, and welcome to the October Pressbooks product update. I'm Steele Wagstaff, and we're going to start by covering some of the things that we've worked on lately that we've released that we want to, we're excited to share with you. Um, the first set of features that we want to show you are some recent changes to the Pressbooks directory. So what I want to start is by showing you at the when you first visit the directory, you're going to notice that the default display order now will now show you in the order of recency. So more recent books will more recently updated books will always display near the top. So you'll always generally see a fresh set of books as the directory is updated, showing you the more recent books at the top. However, once you perform a search, so for example, if I were to search history, you'll notice that the display order over here is now displaying based on relevance. So we have a relevance-based filtering and search mechanism. Anytime you apply a search term or and or a filter, the, the search results will automatically try to display based on relevance. So for example, I might say, I want books that have five H5P activities about his, that have history in them. And so it's gonna to try to look for relevance. So title obviously is a high relevance activity. These top books will probably have titles. They'll probably have covers. They may have descriptions. Um, and so we're trying to display some orders in relevance. Now, once you've performed the search, you can of course choose to change back to date updated. And this will show you the more updated books first, or you could change to alphabetical order. And you can see them displayed in alphabetical order here. So those are some of the options that are now available. Um, you'll see that if we were to clear this out, like if I were to take the search term out and remove the filter, it will switch back to just displaying in the default uh, last recently updated order. But that's a new feature that we've added. It's a, it's a relevancy-based filtering searching. And the Travis has really been instrumental in helping us think about that as the librarian, and we'll be continuing to work with us on future improvements for displaying more relevant search results. And a couple other things that Travis helped us to do. One is you'll notice that if you see a book that has a cover, this right here is a link to the book. So if you were to launch this, it would link, it would click this link, it would launch the book. So will the cover as well. So if I click the cover, it will also launch the book in the real world as well as the title. If you find a book that has H5P activities you'll see here we're displaying how many H5P activities there are. Um, this is gonna tell you how many of these interactive components a user has created in their book. And clicking on this link will take you to a special H5P listing page for each book. So for example, this digital workbook has 131 H5P activities. So it will also show you the names of the activities. And if you want to see what the activity looks like, you could say, Oh, here's the Crater Lake activity. And then you could reuse it or embed it or clone the book and get it if it was embedded in the book. You can also expand all of them on a given page so you can see 20 at a time to kind of scroll through and see what kinds of activities a book has if you're thinking about adopting it or wanting to see the range of interactive possibilities. And then at the bottom, you'll see some pagination. When there's a bunch of activities like 130, you'll see we put 20 per page. So you can scroll through and see the next set of 20 or the third set of 20 or so forth. So that's a new feature that we've added and we think that's gonna help people find and quickly identify, does this book have the kind of interactive content that we want? And earlier in the chat, there was a question about the H5P thing that I was showing. Does the page that shows H5P activities show all the H5P activities in a book's backend or just the ones that are embedded into pages? This is gonna show you all of the H5P activities that have been created in that book. Even if the activity is only like a demo activity or only partially built, this H5P list page will include it. And so someone could look at it and be like, oh, that is useful, that is not useful. Now it says right here, only the ones that have been inserted into book content will be included if you clone this book. So if this book has 20 H5P activities that haven't been inserted anywhere and you clone the book, it won't clone the 20 that weren't inserted anywhere. It will only clone activities that have been inserted into public openly licensed content in your book. So that's a nice protection if you're the author and you've got something that's not quite ready for building yet. But it's also nice if you wanna share a work in progress H5P activity, they'll be available there and someone could download it, import it to their book and then finish it. So it's a way to share things that aren't finished but only clone the things that are. And that's kind of the kind of compromise that we built for that. So hopefully that answered the question that Ed had. Uh, I'm going to pause my uh, screen sharing presentation and I'll pass it over to Travis, who's going to talk a little bit about um, some stuff that he and Lee have been working on related to collections and the directory. 
Thanks, Dion. Hi, everyone. Uh, just once again, I'm, I'm Travis, the Pressbooks librarian, and I'm excited to tell you all about collections. Uh, so collections are, they're basically OER grouped by a particular theme, like, like healthcare or interactive OER. Uh, the topics are chosen based on uh, general demand, uh, feedback from the OER community and, and resources uh, available in the directory. And we created collections for a few reasons. Uh, one is that the directory keeps getting bigger. And for anyone looking for OER, we, we wanted to surface some of the, uh, the content that we think is really exceptional. Uh, when someone visits the directory for the first time, it can be kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of content to sift through and collections help bring uh, that exceptional OER to the surface. Uh, we also hear from librarians and, and faculty that certain subjects are in demand or are underrepresented in OER. Collections really make it easy to define those resources in one place. For those looking to create their own OER, these books can provide some, uh, some inspiration. A lot of them feature, they feature beautiful formatting and uh, creative use of interactive elements. And collections also just make it easier to find things. You know, in, in a perfect world, uh, I think everyone would create OER with you know, beautiful, complete metadata. Uh, so collections really help surface resources that might otherwise be difficult to find. I'll show you some examples and where, where you can find these collections. Uh, we display a few right, right near the top of the directory here. Uh, if you click on one of these book covers, it'll display the, the collection in the search results below down here. For the full list of collections, we have this search filter here on the left. Uh, you'll find the name of each collection and the number of books it contains. If you want to know a little more about them, uh, over on pressbooks.com, uh, we have what we call the collections hub, and this is just a page with with brief descriptions of each collection. Um, I can put a link in the chat if you'd like to, to have a look uh, on your own. Uh, we've set up uh, some landing pages as well, just for collections uh, that we wanna promote on social media. Um, it's not really important to the function of the directory, but it's it's here if you wanna to see a little blurb about what you know, what's in each collection and, and maybe what some of the inspiration was. Uh, I've also written some blog articles with details about some of the content. So there, there's really a lot to dive into if you're curious. So when we create collections, uh, we, we aim for quality over quantity. Uh, right now, they're, they're fairly small. Uh, the fine arts collection is the biggest just because the scope is, is quite broad. Uh, we look for Creative Commons licenses, usually licenses that allow derivatives, but there are some exceptions just based on the, the subject matter. Uh, we try to choose a variety of OER rather than having multiple items covering the same material. Uh, we look at things like presentation and formatting, uh, content and how it compares to other OER, uh, interactive elements. We generally select original books rather than derivatives, um, unless the, the originals are outdated or unavailable, or maybe if a derivative is heavily modified and offers some additional content. So just to go back to the directory, uh, this is the healthcare collection here. I've put together not just a bunch of books about healthcare, but I've I've really looked for a diversity of, of healthcare topics. So there's, there's more general stuff about nursing and anatomy, but there's, you know, there's also stuff about Northern and indigenous healthcare, uh, which sometimes gets overlooked in, in, in some programs. Uh, there are some great examples of textbooks that have been cloned and tailored to, to a different course multiple times. So you know, now they've got all kinds of fantastic additional content and it really helps highlight the collaborative nature of OER. And these collections are, are quite collaborative as well because you know often people will reach out to us on social media uh, and they'll they might suggest this book or that book and we've we've made some really great additions that way and they'll expand and grow over time these are these are kind of living collections so uh, we're always thinking about new new collections and listening to feedback from the community uh, and it's it's thanks to the you know the great oer community for for creating these these resources and fostering such a a collaborative culture and we're, we're excited to have another way to, to showcase some of that hard work. Thanks so much, Travis. I, I had a question ahead of time from someone in this meeting. They said, hey, these collections look great. Could you show us how I would navigate or find a collection on the directory? Yes. I think you showed that briefly, but could you kind of walk somebody through from Pressbooks directory, how they could look within a collection or see which collections we do have available? Sure. So um let's say you want one of the collections that's not listed up here you could go down to the search filters on the left here and just expand these and just click the check mark next to whichever collection you want to see so say for instance you want to see a language learning collection i'll just click this check mark 
and then I'll see all the books in that collection. And I can see up here, there are 16 books. This is actually a filter, which you can, you can see here. So, um, you know, just make sure if you have any other filters applied that you're, you're, you're clearing those, otherwise it might limit your, uh, your search results. Uh, this is it, it's, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, I saw a question in the chat here from Lauren, or maybe a statement. I would love to see a student created books collection. Is that in the works? It is actually. Uh, that's that's on our. I think that's the next one where we have on the agenda. So uh, stay tuned for that. Awesome. And then if people had suggestions for other collections they'd like to see, or books they want to have added to existing collections, what's the best way to make that request? The best way is uh, is over social media. Um, so you can just tweet at us or or even contact us on on LinkedIn. Uh, we usually respond pretty quickly. Thanks so much, Travis. It's been really awesome. I think having a librarian on staff at Pressbooks that helps to think about metadata, thinks about findability, and also thinks about how each of you, many of you are librarians or instructional designers, are thinking about organizing and finding information for your instructors. So thanks for all your work on that, Travis, and we look forward to what's coming next. Probably a student authored OER collection, just as was requested. Okay, the next thing I want to show are some things that are happening with uh, the Pressbooks product itself. The first is kind of a minor change, but it may be important for some of your users. So what I want to share is if you are a new user to Pressbooks and you have been invited to join a book with a role, the next time you log into Pressbooks, you will see in your dashboard an updated book invitations and book permissions widget. So this book permissions widget will show you what you can do if you have no roles. You could create a book or clone a book. That's how you get started. But if you have been invited to join a book, you will get an email about this. But sometimes people delete those emails or they don't read them. So let's say they log into Pressbooks. You will see on your dashboard all of the invitations to join a book that have been made for you. So this user, Rick, has been enjoyed, invited to join this book as a collaborator. Let's accept that invitation. He's been invited to join this book as an author and this book as an editor. So now you'll see when Rick goes to this board, you'll see these books that he's joined now are available in his My Book list. So if Rick were to log out, and then let's log back in as Rick, and if Rick goes to their admin dashboard, you can see here are the other two books they haven't accepted invitations for. If and when they accept those invitations, they'll also show up in their available list for My Books. So we just tried to make it a little bit easier for new users to kind of orient themselves and realize if you've been invited to join a book, your invitation will just be pending here unless you accept it or until you accept it. So hopefully that helps people uh, not forget about pending invitations they have to join books and makes it a little bit smoother for new users. Um, another thing that we did was we have added in our export routines, in particular with McLuhan, people wanted to be able to customize the footnote font size separately from the body font size in their PDF exports. I know Ed Beck has asked us about this, as have other people in the past. So now in the newest release of Pressbooks, there is in your, uh, so to find this, you'd go to a sample book, you'd come to appearance, theme options, and the PDF options tab. And you'll see there always was a body font size choice. So let's make this 12 point. And then there's also now a footnote font size, which you can make separate. So we're gonna make that, let's see, the two thirds the size of the body font size. And I'm gonna then save these changes. Once I've done that, the next time I make an export for my book, you'll, you'll notice that there is a distinct difference now between the body font size and the footnote font size. So I will make a PDF just real quickly here, and then I will download my PDF and show it to you. So here in this book, I have a chapter with footnotes. You can see here my body font size is at 12, and my footnote font size is much smaller. You can change and adjust that as desired for your themes. This will be available in any of the themes that support what we call Buckram. So the majority of Pressbooks themes will have this option available, but some of the very old themes will not. If you'd like to use that feature and it's not available in your current theme, the advice would be to switch to a theme that does support it. And that's available now for all users. Another thing that we did are kind of a couple of minor changes, but we talked a little bit about the new contributor feature that we've added. If you haven't seen that before, but there's a guide chapter all about it that we'll put in the chat, but the contributors feature is awesome and we think it's really powerful. But um, one of the changes that we made is if I add a new contributor to my book, let's make this person an editor. So I've added Dalcine as a contributor to my book. And now I'm gonna add Amy as well to this book. And we'll make her an author. 
When you add new users to your books, we will automatically create new contributors. And when we create the contributor, we will bring in the user profile information for them. And the difference now is we will also bring in their Gravatar photo if there was a photo associated with them. So at the time of creation, if the user had a Gravatar photo image, we will import it and size it properly as their contributor profile picture. If you don't like this, let's say Amy is like, hey, that's not actually my face or something, you can change it by editing their profile. Um, and I'll show you a change that we made to the editing of profiles. So friendly human doesn't have a profile picture, but would like one. So here it tells us the images should be square, 400 pixels. Previously, if you, if you uploaded a very large image, you can crop it and resize it. But if you have one that's already the right size, we will just skip the cropping step entirely. So let me show you the two methods. One, I'm going to upload photos. I'm going to select a file here, and I'm going to pick a very large. I don't know if this one's large. I think this one's probably too large. And then we will we get to this stage, and we say, OK, how do we want to crop this? OK, let's crop it like this. It's giving you a crop option. And now this image has been cropped. But if you pick an image that's already been sized correctly, so let me pick one that's already 400 by 400. This image, when I click accept this image, it just applies it. It doesn't ask you to crop it because it recognizes it's already the right size. So those are a couple of changes that we made for how we handle that contributor feature and try to make that a little bit easier for people to use with their profile pictures. So that's what we've done there for contributors. You can now see that this user has a profile picture as do these others, which were imported from Gravatar. Uh, and then finally, another kind of product change that we made was we improved the logging for our SAML importer. So if you're doing a single sign-on with SAML, we now just have better logging in the back end in case you have problems or you have issues or you had trouble setting it up. This is better logging tools for us as administrators. Most of you that are using it are already using it successfully without issue. This is just helpful when you're first setting it up and you run into issues. Better logging really helps us diagnose the problem and solve it faster. So that's a pretty minor change, but it's helpful for us and our support team. Um, the last thing I wanted to share is what we're working on now and what's coming next. So the big project that we've been working on over the last couple of weeks um, is improving our export routines, particularly for the EPUB export format. So I'm going to show you in Pressbooks right now. When you go to make an export, you have the supported option is the old EPUB 2 standard specification. And then we have EPUB 3 listed over in other formats. Um, EPUB 3 has now been the accepted standard for quite some time, and EPUB 2 is quite old. So all of the major book readers now support EPUB 3, and EPUB 3 is really a better, kind of more modern standard because it uses the modern versions of HTML and, and CSS. So you can make well-formatted web books, and they will look good in the EPUB 3 specification. So our team is working on refactoring our EPUB exports. So in the near future, there will be one EPUB export option, and it will be EPUB 3.2, which is the latest version of the specification. We're really excited for this. We're going to be able to fix and clean up some old legacy issues in the EPUB exports. And we think the end result will be cleaner, better, easier to maintain EPUB exports with less confusion about what's the difference between EPUB 2 and EPUB 3. We'll just be making one newest version of the EPUB export for everybody. At the same time, we're also going to be working on cleaning up the underlying HTML and PDF exports. That'll be coming a little bit later, but we want to make better and more accessible exports for your PDFs and your EPUBs. So that's a little bit um, invisible work, but we do think it will result in just better, easier to maintain exports in the short and the longer term going forward. A lot of you have been wanting to know about page views and how widely visited your books are. Historically, the way that Pressbooks has supported that is we have allowed network managers to configure Google Analytics as a third party service, which means you send all of you it, Google Analytics adds page tracking information with JavaScript to your site. And then when a person visits the site, it sends information to Google and Google Analytics will present the dashboard to you as the person who's configured it. That's good for many people, but some people don't want to use Google Analytics for a variety of reasons. And in other cases, um, the network manager would like to be able to let book authors see their individual book dashboard page views more easily. So we've been working on a solution that we think is both 
privacy protective and doesn't involve third party tracking software and that can do this at the level of the book. And so I want to show you some cool stuff that, that's um, in the works. All right, first. So the, what will happen is at the level of your root site, there will be in your dashboard a little analytics button. And you can configure the, the date range that you'd like to see for this. So I might want to see the last quarter. And this will show me since the beginning of October, the total number of page views I have had on my homepage and on my catalog page. Maybe I want to look for just the last month. And you'll see on this day, it will show me how many page views and visitors I had on each day for a given site, uh, for my root site. So I can see this site had 75 visitors and 142 page views on my integration site. And that was 80 more than it was in the previous period. And these are the people that are most commonly referring people to my site. The other thing that's gonna happen is in addition to being on your network root site, a similar dashboard will exist for every book on your site. And that's the part that I think is most exciting for uh, book authors and for you as network managers. Um, we still need to get this configured and working correctly for all of our networks. It will be very soon. But you might be able to see, for example, this had 10 page views on October 2nd, one page view on October 14th. This is not the most visited book in the world, but more visited books will give you much more interesting information. And then they will show you which chapters in your book or pages in your book were visited most frequently, how many visitors, how many page views. Um, you'll also see that there's a few settings that are available. So if you want to exclude page views for logged in users, so only people from the open web who are visiting your site, that will be there. And you can decide whether or not to set cookies. A cookie, some people don't like setting cookies because it gets stored in a user's browser. So you can respect others by saying no cookies. If you turn cookies off, you won't be able to know whether they're a return visitor but the, the feature will function pretty similarly. And then you can also change your default date period and decide whether you want to dump your data after a certain amount of months or preserve it over time. So that's coming soon. It's not quite available. It's there on your books, but it's not working 100% fully functional, but it will be quite soon. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a future product update and share with you that. But we think that's a really nice feature um, to help people understand how frequently their books are visited without needing third-party software or invading users' privacy if you don't want to do that. Um, the first question was, will authors be able to see this, not just admins? The answer is yes. Anyone who is a book administrator will be able to see that analytics dashboard in their book. I don't think right now that book editors and book authors will see it, but I could be mistaken. I'd have to double check on that. Um, Ed was asking about including other information on that page. Right now, Ed, um, we can only include page view information, but we would, we're, we're thinking about ways that we can hook and extend this to include some page events. The one that we're most interested in adding support for would be book downloads. So if you've made file downloads available on your web book homepage, that's information that we know everybody would like to have. And we're trying to find a way to add that information there. It's still some ways away, but that's on our roadmap. You asked about a couple of other things, which would be how many clones interact with H5P activities. That's not on our roadmap right now, but we, um, if we can figure out the page down, book downloads, we might look at some of the more difficult ones in the future as well. Thanks for suggesting those. Thanks all for attending the Pressbooks product update this month. We're excited to see you in November um, and appreciate what you do for the open education communities on your various campuses and at your institutions.